We have on the Cam Rogers Show Mike O'Donnell joining the program here. He's, of course, a college basketball analyst on ESPN and CBS. Mike O'Donnell, appreciate the time, sir. You were just watching Cincinnati and Houston yesterday. What do you make of those two teams? Well, thanks for having me on, Cam. I really appreciate it. Uh, Cincy is tough. Um, you know, I think we knew that going in. This has the potential to be Mick Cronin's best team. Uh, since he's taken over at Cincinnati, because we love the way that they defend. Every single team in the country hates playing Cincinnati right. because it's going to be World War III every time, and it's going to be an absolute battle in the paint and on the perimeter. But the difference is they got three guys that are potential 20-point scoring threats every time they step on the floor. So you combine great defense and physicality with really, really great offense, and the Bearcats are tough. Um, but Houston – is one of my favorite teams that people don't know enough about. Uh, I think people forget that they're one of the top 10 field goal percentage defensive teams in the country, and they have a legit 30-point scoring threat in Rob Gray Jr., the best scorer in the country you don't know enough about. So I think when you combine great scoring, great defense, and they're a good rebounding team as well, this Houston team, if they make it to the second weekend, I won't be as shocked as a lot of people are. Let's take a look at uh, the number one overall seeds here, Michael. We got Xavier, Kansas, Villanova, and Virginia. Out of those four, which team scares you the most that can make the most noise heading into the Final Four and actually win the title? Yeah, well, I think pretty all deserving number one seeds. I think a lot of people had some questions about Xavier, if they actually really deserved it or not. But uh, Virginia and Villanova are the scariest teams in the tournament, regardless of seed. Uh, Virginia only lost one game in the ACC, one game. That's insane. That's unheard of. And their defense is maybe the best defensive team in the last 10 years of us keeping uh, uh, defensive efficiency ratings. And then you have Villanova, who has arguably the best player in the country, and Jalen Brunson Jr. And it's funny, he may not even be the best player on the team, on, his, on this Villanova team. I mean, you've got, you got to go Mikhail Burgess. He's a, a tremendous lethal scorer. And then, but the, the difference with those two teams is obviously you have the depth from a uh, NCAA tournament standpoint. You got a coach who's won a national championship. You have players on this team who have won a national championship. That matters. Uh, I think people like to be cliche and say that, uh, you know, that's, you know, they have great team chemistry and all that. That's fine. You can talk about that all you want. This team knows how to win, and they know how to win in the tournament. And to me, it's going to come down to Virginia and Villanova in the championship game. And that is going to be absolutely beautiful basketball to watch. And I think sure. those two teams are, no question, the most dangerous teams in the tournament. Well, let's talk about the Cavs a little bit. Virginia, Tony Bennett has yet to make a Final Four. And we know what Virginia does. They play strong defense. Their guards are pretty good, perhaps better than in past years. But they still haven't gotten there yet, Mike. And that was kind of the storyline with Villanova for all those years, right? And then they finally won the title. Could this be the time for Virginia to finally buck that trend and Tony Bennett takes his squad to the Final Four? I think so. Uh, you know, you got to remember, Cam, you know, Virginia's name isn't being mentioned as one of the cheating schools. I mean, it takes yeah. time to build a program the right way. And uh, I think Tony Bennett is doing just that. Uh, when you look at this Virginia team, they weren't ranked in the top 25. They were picked to middle to lower pack in the ACC preseason rankings. And you have two really, really good guards in Kyle Guy and Ty Jerome, uh, but two players that never thought, uh, nobody thought they would be as good as they are. You knew they were going to be good defensively. This team has all the tools. Uh, this is, might be the most complete team that we've seen in the last 10 years of college basketball. I'm not saying the best team, but I'm saying the most complete team. When you talk about combining great defense with highly efficient offense, uh, this, they have great guard play. Uh, they're strong on the interior. You're not going to see them press, but they run a defense called the pack line defense, and it's essentially almost impossible to score over 65 points against Virginia. And the thing that I love about Virginia and this team is if they're off, if Ty Jerome and Kyle, Kyle Guy are missing the perimeter shots because they are excellent three-point shooters, they are very comfortable winning games in the high 40s and low 50s. Yeah. Most teams aren't accustomed to playing that style of basketball. And to me, when your legs are tired, when your arms are tired, when your shot's not falling, when it's short playing in a massive, massive dome to where your depth perception is off, I love teams like Virginia 
who can lock up and if they're if they won a game 48 to 45 the Virginia Cavalier fan base would be smiling going absolutely bonkers because that's exactly what they need to do and what they can do given the fact that they're comfortable in the low uh, in the low 50s high 40s playing games most teams aren't as you see, folks, you can take a look at the Virginia Cavaliers tournament profile there, and we'll flash some of the graphics of the official bracket here for March Madness, as well as I chat with Mike O'Donnell of ESPN and CBS Sports. Mike, did you have a chance to check out the selection Sunday yesterday? I mean, the internet kind of broke where people were like, what is going on? First of all, the video and the audio weren't synced up. Then you had like the live studio audience. And I just want to get your thoughts on the whole new presentation. Of course, it was on TNT yesterday rather than CBS. So a lot of differences in yesterday's show. Yeah, you know, uh, unfortunately, and this is not, I am not copping out, I promise, Cam, but uh, we were doing a live show for the American Digital Network last night, literally in the middle of uh, the selection show, but I recorded it because I'm completely insane, and I'm a college <laughs> basketball junkie, so I watched it after the fact, and there's no question, I think, um, I think it's pretty easy to say much can be improved. The live audience didn't bother me. Um, I... My favorite part of the selection uh, show in the last couple of years has been, you know, the uncertainty of who was going to get in. And uh, I love Ernie Johnson. I think he's incredible. Um, but I think uh, uh, Gumbel is, is the guy to release the entire bracket. I enjoyed it when they went by region to region. That was my favorite part uh, of, this, of the selection show. I think most people agreed with that. I think an hour-long show was perfect. Um, if they want to put a live audience, that doesn't really bother me. I was a little bit taken back by going in alphabetical order. I thought that was a little odd. I thought that took away from some of the anticipation of, of the selection show. But it goes back to CBS next year. Uh, you know, TBS uh, uh, um, b b with the new package and the new rights deal between CBS, Turner Sports, CBS, and the NCAA. This was the year for TBS to try something new. They certainly tried something new. Uh, I will be surprised if it's the exact same format next year uh, when it goes back to CBS uh, for the entirety of the show. Do you think it's just because sports fans out there, Mike, just hate change? And we're traditionalists, it seems. And first of all, it's like humanistic gut instinct to not like change. But like for sports fans, we like the tradition yeah. and all this stuff. We hear about complaints about changes to other different formats in sports, too. Maybe that's just kind of part of the reason why people really didn't like the new format. But I do agree with you in terms of the alphabetical revealance of these teams just really didn't make too much sense because you almost had to keep track and then remember which teams were in the field, right? Right, right. You know, I, here's you, you fight this all the time, right, Cam? I mean, you're, 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 you have to dive deep in the statistics and the analytics of your audience. And across the country... Uh, everybody's split, you know, you have the diehards who want the same thing over and over again because that's comfortable for them. And then a lot of times you have the, the, the younger folks, I can't believe I just said younger folks, by the way, how about <laughs> millennial generation? Um, guys like you, Cam, I'm an old guy, man, I'm closing in on 33. Uh, but you have the millennial generation that uh, they embrace change. And a lot of times they're like, you know, the thought process of like, look, we've done this a million times. This is boring. My attention span is maybe 10 seconds long. And I think that's why you brought in the live studio audience. You try to shake things up a little bit. I never fault anybody for trying to trying to go for something that encap uh, that can change an entire audience that really try tries to push the envelope because we have to progress as media. The media landscape is constantly changing. The way we consume content is always revolving, always sure. changing, and, and at, a, at a pace in which, quite honestly, I have a hard time keeping up because I think the way that people like to consume content is changing for them. I don't think there's just this strict segment of population that's on their phones all the time. I don't think it's just the iPad. I don't think it's just the computer. I think it's just the TV. I think it's this we're, we're trying to grab a, an age demographic knowing that that age demographic is still trying to figure out the best way they like to consume content. So, so uh, uh, media entities that try to change what style of format they're distributing content, I don't have a problem with. 
but they do need to adjust and rely on your audience to, when something's been so good for so long that does make you raise an eyebrow and say, it, was this actually the best change? Okay, we took a shot, great. CBS and Turner Sports, they still have the NCAA tournament until 2024. It's not forever, but it's still a big chunk of time. And I right. think, you know, when it goes back to CBS, you'll probably see – You'll probably see more of the traditional formats. Maybe it's just distributed differently the way it's streamed. Um, again, maybe you combine the old format with a live studio audience and that makes everybody happy. Great, that's fine. Um, but we consume content in a way that's baffling to me and nobody's really kind of figured out uh, the formula. And that goes for ESPN, CBS, you know, Stadium Sports, Fox Sports. Everybody's trying to figure it out. And everybody swung and miss, and then there have been some home runs. So it's going to take time, and, uh, and we'll see what happens. No doubt. It certainly seems like we're in that middle part of this transition from the cable TV era over on to the mobile era. And, of course, uh, Turner Sports and CBS trying to find that happy medium there. So certainly a solid effort at that at change. Let's go back to the hardwood here, Mike. And I want to talk about Xavier, the number one seed here in the West region. Big East at large team got bounced by Providence in the tournament. In 2017, they lost to Gonzaga in the Elite Eight, talking about previously with Providence, of course, the Big East tournament. What do we make of Xavier? Because I feel like they're going to be a popular early exit for many people who fill out their brackets. Well, I think this, this could be the best team that Chris Mack has had uh, since being at Xavier. I think they are a legitimate Sweet 16 team. I don't have them going to the lead eight. Um, if you look at the gauntlet that they have to go through, I mean, between I, I think they're going to get bounced by Gonzaga, mm -hmm. um, and then if they do get passed by Gonzaga, they got to go through Michigan or North Carolina. And I think this Michigan team is a legitimate Final Four team. Uh, it's it's a it's a Wolverine squad that um, has gotten better over the course of the season, and to me. It's not necessarily what you've done in the first 10 games of the season. It's how you're playing right now. And what they did in the Big Ten tournament was insane. I do not see Xavier getting past Michigan to get to the Final Four. I have Michigan going to the Final Four. I think this team is built for a, a deep late run in March. Xavier can score. Their, their starting five is great. They have a great six man. And then after that, there's some questions. I don't know if Xavier has the depth to really advance beyond the Sweet 16 in this tournament. So it wouldn't be March Madness and the bracket reveal without any controversy, Mike. And we have a few nuggets of controversy. You can talk about Syracuse, but I want to talk about Oklahoma here. They're in the field despite losing eight of their last ten. And it seems as though the committee has essentially said, well, we're looking at the entire season. It's not how you finish, but looking at those wins, even in the early part of the season when Oklahoma was stealing a lot of headlines with Trey Young, who's going to be an exciting player to watch in this tournament. Do you have any problem with the Sooners in the field? Um, well, I have a pro they should not have gotten over USC, in my opinion. I think USC's entire body of work. Uh, was better than Oklahoma's. Uh, I do believe that the Big 12 is superior than the Pac-12. Um, but this is a little bit of the Trey Young effect. And if you're looking at the entire body of work, sure, you, there is no question you can make an argument. But when you lose eight out of your last ten games, that is a, that is a major cause for concern. Um, I think, though, here, here, here's going to be the interesting thing, Cam. I do not think that Oklahoma should have got in, but I am not angry about Oklahoma getting in. Uh, because they're going to be facing non-Big 12 opponents in this tournament. They have Rhode Island, which is a going to be an awesome game because that Rhode Island team is really good. I'll also be surprised if Coach Hurley is still there after this season. Wouldn't be surprised if he took the UConn job, who uh, UConn recently fired Kevin Ollie. But nobody has faced, outside of the Big 12, very few teams have faced a player like Trey Young. Trey Young is a player that when he gets hot can take you to the Sweet 16. If Oklahoma wins the first two games and they go to the second weekend of the tournament, I won't be surprised uh, because of the Trey Young effect for two reasons. One, he's going to turn on a lot of TV sets. And you're kidding yourself if you don't think that uh, uh, big uh, uh, blue brands, uh, blue blood brands actually play effect into the NCAA tournament selection. Right. They absolutely do. 
That's the reason why I think that Middle Tennessee did not get into the tournament. That was a major, uh, a major bubble team that should have got in. But Oklahoma is certainly capable of advancing and proving a lot of the doubters wrong because of matchups. It's not always about the seed. It's not always about how good of a team you are right now. Everything comes down to the matchup. That's why we see teams like Butler and VCU make Final Four runs is because how you match up with that particular team. And if that team has not faced a high-volume shooter and scorer like Trey Young and Trey Young's hot, he can single-handedly take Oklahoma to the Sweet 16. No doubt. Sometimes it's about how those dominoes fall in the tournament. So we'll see about Oklahoma. There you see they take on Rhode Island. You mentioned the Wolverines a little bit. I want to talk more about this squad here. Big Ten champions, John Beeline squad, entering the tournament on an 11-game win streak, 14th in BPI, playing in the West region. And you look at the matchups here. Of course, they have Montana to start things off. We'll play the winner of Houston and San Diego State. You've got North Carolina in that region, too. Providence looks pretty good as well. But, man, Mike, I'm telling you, Michigan, they are balanced. They have a good defensive squad. We talk about Virginia and their defense, but the Wolverines have it, too. How deep can they go, the Wolverines? Well, they have a great offense, too, and their front court is as good as any front court in the country. Uh, I think a lot of people, when you talk about great front courts, you would immediately think of Purdue. Uh, but this Michigan team dismantled the Boilermakers. Uh, this is a very, very good Michigan Wolverine team. Coach Beeline is, uh, has been the, one of the top five best coaches in the country in the last 10 years, in my opinion. Uh, another guy that we won't really hear much conversation of related to any FBI probe. You know, he never gets the McDonald's All-Americans, but he develops players, four-year players, uh, better than anybody else in the country. They have an incredible front court. They run an offense that's very difficult to guard. It's very much a combination between Princeton and dribble drive, and it's fun to watch. And defensively, they're great in the scatter report. I mean, if you look at their road, like you said, they have Montana to open up, and then they face the, the winner of Houston and San Diego State, two teams that, that they can easily take care of to advance to the Sweet 16 and then a potential matchup versus Providence or UNC, I think it's going to be North Carolina. I am not big on North Carolina. Um, I think they have plenty of talent. I think they're very athletic. They are not deep, and they actually have a hard time scoring. And I think this Michigan team uh, could easily beat North Carolina by double digits uh, if they actually face each other in the Sweet 16 or the Elite Eight. I really, really like this Michigan team. I think you're dead on. I've picked Michigan to go to Final Four. And I think most people need to take a good, hard look at the Wolverines this year because they are legit. Talking with college basketball analyst Mike O'Donnell here on the Cam Rogers Show. Mike, you revealed one of your teams in the Final Four there. You got Michigan in. Open up that crystal ball for us. What's your entire Final Four looking like? Yeah, I got Kansas, Villanova, uh, Virginia, and Michigan. Um, Kansas is playing uh, typical Kansas basketball as of late. Uh, this is a really, really great team. The thing that's great about Kansas is they have a player in Devontae Graham uh, who's done very well in the NCAA tournament. Uh, he's one of the best point guards in the country. He's up for the Naismith Player of the Year Award. And they have a ridiculous, ridiculously strong front court uh, between uh, Adoko Azubuki and Silvio D'Souza. Those guys are monsters. And they shoot the three ball well and then they crash the offensive glass. They're pretty good defensively. They're not great, but they're, they don't turn the ball over. They have great scoring, and their ability to crash the offensive glass is incredible. And I think this Kansas team is really good. I could see them getting to the Final Four. Uh, we mentioned Villanova briefly between Jalen Brunson, Phil Booth. Uh, that, those two players, Mikel Bridges, those three guys uh, can get you to the Final Four. They've been there. They understand what it takes. They, this is a very deep Villanova team. This is a disciplined Villanova team. They did drop a couple games in the Big East, but I love Villanova in March. It's so hard to pick uh, against those guys, uh, depending on the matchup. If you take a look, they'll, they'll take care of um, um, Loyal Illinois, Brooklyn, and Radford, and then they'll face the winner of Virginia Tech and Alabama. I think that's an easy road, very easy road. Uh, to get to the Sweet 16, and then they could face potentially West Virginia or Wichita State in the Elite Eight. 
and uh, or or match up with Purdue. But that is a that's the Villanova has the easiest schedule to get to the Final Four. Kansas would have to go through Michigan State or Duke to get to the Final Four. That's no easy task. Virginia has the most difficult road to get to the Final Four. The committee absolutely crushed the number one overall seed in the tournament. Virginia has to go through would have to go through Arizona. They'd have to go through Cincinnati, and they'd have to go through Tennessee and, and potentially Kentucky. This is a monster, monster uh, 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 in the South. And, and you start out in Boise. Well, Boise might have uh, the most tuned-in audience, go figure, uh, in the entire NCAA tournament because you have huge brand names in Arizona – is so underseeded, it's crazy. I think Arizona should have been a two or three seed, mm -hmm. and Kentucky very well could have been a four seed. So Virginia has a gauntlet to get through to get to the Final Four. They can do it, but by far Virginia has the most difficult road to get to the Final Four. That South region is no doubt rich in talent. Gonna be a fun one to watch as we go through March Madness. Mike, joining the Cam Rogers Show right now, before we let you go, I want you to give our audience your number one tip as they fill out their brackets, because we can take in so much information at once and our brains explode. But if there's one thing to really stick to, what is it? Well, if you're diving into stats and analytics and research, if you're just doing simple research to look up, you've got to look up at matchups. And if you have a high volume uh, scoring team matched up with a great defensive team, I take defense 9.9 .9 times out of 10 in the NCAA tournaments. Um, and I also take senior leadership. If you look at, you wanna look at how old teams are uh, and you look at their starting five, do they have a, uh, a group of seniors that's been on the squad for a while? I think senior leadership and defense play a large part into a deep Final Four run. Uh, it's all about matchups and, 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 and senior leadership to where you could say, we understand how to win big games. Who's playing well hot right now is another huge issue. When you look at defense, when you look at senior leadership and who's playing well right now, that's why I, I, I think you and I both agree Michigan's so good because they're playing great. They have senior leadership and they defend. And those three characteristics usually take you far in March. I don't always fall in love with the 12 over 5 seed um, uh, matchup, but a, there, there is definitely a sleeper team that could go to the lead eight this year and that's St. Bonaventure. Take some time, read about the Bonnies. Uh, that's a team to where if they make it to the lead eight, everybody's gonna be going crazy because they don't understand what's going on. That is a really, really good basketball team that can score, that has veteran leadership, and they uh, were crushing the Atlantic 10 this year. A very, very, very dangerous team. I love the Bonnies, uh, St. Bonaventure this year as, as a big sleeper pick for the Sweet 16 or the Elite Eight. You heard it here first, ladies and gentlemen, on the program. College basketball analyst Mike O'Donnell joining us here live. Mike, do appreciate the time, sir. You're a busy man. Wish you all the best. I appreciate it, Cam. Thank you. Love your stuff, man.